Hello, my name is Dr. Andreas Brunklaus. I'm a consultant pediatric neurologist at the Royal Hospital for Children in Glasgow in the United Kingdom. And it's my great pleasure to talk at this uh, Innovation Technology in Child Neurology and Surgery Congress in uh, Russia today. And I'm very grateful for the organizers to invite me to talk about patient registries and how patient registries can improve epilepsy care. So first of all, to give an overview of my presentation, I would like to start really with a model disease of childhood genetic epilepsy, which is Dravet syndrome, and how um, uh, this gives us a rationale for developing patient registries and why this might be useful. Then I will give some other examples of patient registries. We'll discuss the advantages and disadvantages, uh, as well as the data management and usage of patient registries, uh, discuss the setup, um, and then also participation and collaboration. So first of all, um, to talk uh, a little bit about Drave syndrome and how Drave syndrome became a model for studying childhood genetic epilepsies. And you will see throughout this presentation um, how we've come a long way in um, discovery of uh, this disorder and now having more up-to-date treatments and how registries uh, really can help uh, moving us to the next uh, stage in um, epilepsy care. So Dravet syndrome, really, it still starts with the discovery of the action potential by Hodgkin and Huxley in 1952. And then Charlotte Dravet really defined the clinical phenotype of Dravet syndrome. The first medication uh, really sh shown to be uh, efficacious, particularly efficacious in Dravet syndrome, was Stiripentol, uh, published in the Lancet in 2000. And then it was in 2001 when Clacetal really identified um, SCM1A mutations as the cause for Dravet syndrome, previously called uh, myoclonic, uh, uh, severe myoclonic epilepsy of infancy. And this is just an example how um, we had previously this concept of vaccine encephalopathy, but now we know that these all these cases were really cases of Dravet syndrome with um, uh, seizures triggered by uh, by vaccination related fever um, and in 2006 we really had and 11 um, the breakthrough um, animal models from Bill Cattrall and his team really illustrating how it was is the reduced um, sodium current in GABAergic interneurons that is responsible for the um, pathophysiology of syndrome and we uh, more recently had um, uh, new um, treatment options in uh, fenfluramine and uh, cannabidiol for uh, uh, individuals with Dravet syndrome and now we're moving on to gene um, therapy possibilities uh, for Dravet syndrome moving is into us into the future so I think what's very important here is to highlight that Dravet syndrome it's not just an, uh, an epilepsy, uh, it is a channelopathy. So really affecting um, a number of different parts of uh, the central nervous system. So for example, in the uh, hippocampus um, here in mouse model uh, work that could be shown is that it's the inhibitory interneurons that are affected. And if there's haploid insufficiency of the inhibitory interneurons, there's a predominance of excitatory neurons uh, leading to epileptic seizures. But also know that um, this affects the um, cerebellar pukinia cells and we know from individuals with Dravet syndrome that uh, they develop uh, a crouch gait and a movement disorder and really importantly um, this also affects the uh, frontal cortex and here from uh, mouse work on the top left we can see that um, Dravet mice uh, are much more hyperactive as uh, uh, compared to wild type mice, also reflected in the uh, disease phenotype, where we know that individuals with Dravet syndrome tend to have uh, more hyperactivity behavior. And um, we can hear showing that uh, Dravet mice are much less interactive as a sign of um, autism spectrum disorder um, that's reflected also in, in Dravet patients, and that uh, Dravet mice have um, spatial recognition difficulties, um, illustrating again the uh, intellectual 
um, disability that is is also seen um, and uh, in in Drave mice as well as in uh, the um, patients presenting with Dravet syndrome, really illustrating this um, uh, really important aspect of a channelopathy affecting um, uh, many parts of uh, an individual's de development. And here, our work um, uh, in 2012, showing how cognition and comorbidities are affected in Dravet syndrome on the left-hand side, uh, illustrated the developmental de status of individuals uh, over time, then in the first year, second year, third year, and so forth. And what we could show is that in the first year of life, many individuals appear to be developmentally normal. However, then there's increase in uh, mild uh, uh, learning disability to moderate and severe learning disability, um, whereas in teenage years, nearly all individuals have significant um, uh, learning disability. And on the right-hand side, the uh, increase over time of autistic features, behavioral problems, and motor disorders. That's illustrating the um, disease phenotype, not just um, um, presenting with seizures, but also with intellectual disability and many comorbidities. Um, we also know that there's a significant burden of illness associated with a Dravet syndrome. And here there's a study by Adam Strelsik et al. looking at the costs um, to the individual and, uh, from, uh, and uh, society of um, patients with Drave syndrome, showing that there's um, direct healthcare costs, which are significant, but also indirect healthcare costs due to loss of income uh, of a parent, for example. And we know that the mortality in Dravet syndrome is really high, about 10% of children with Dravet syndrome die of a sudden unexpected uh, death uh, in epilepsy before the uh, 20th birthday, and the mortality is 9.32 per 1,000 uh, person years. Really significant here to point out the mortality in Dravet syndrome. This leads us really to the fact why it is so important not to collect data on seizure frequency, but actually collect data on the entire phenotype and have a more systematic approach in data collection in SCM1A related epilepsies, as this is a model disease for childhood genetic epilepsies. And by collecting this more broader data on the entire phenotype, how this might actually help us in the future to manage um, children and to evaluate any uh, future treatments. So for example, we know that we have an emergence of uh, drugs that are effective at, at uh, reducing the seizure burden in Dravet syndrome. However, we do not know what their impact on cognition and development might be. We have the prospect of gene therapy developing uh, over the next five years, and uh, first studies already started. Um, and what is very evident here is that without any systematic data collection, we are simply not able to measure any success beyond um, seizure control. And as I illustrated before, there's so many different aspects to the cognitive development, the behavioral development, um, mortality, um, and other treatment effects uh, that should be um, monitored in the long term. So this is why it's so important to have good quality um, data uh, that are collected. And this will really allow us to characterize the disease phenotype in great detail and to perform in-depth genotype phenotype analyses. So this is to give you an example of how patient registries might actually be really, really successful. And this is the example of the Shell muscular dystrophy uh, in the United Kingdom. The North Star Network was founded in 2003 as a registry for patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And this is now uh, 18 years ago. And initially, this was really established to collect simple um, data on treatment. Because at the time, there was no real evidence to show that steroid treatment and Duchenne muscular dystrophy was helpful. And what the systematic data collection by a registry allowed was really the gathering of data and to show evidence for the first time that steroid treatment in Duchenne muscular dystrophy is really, really useful. And now this registry really forms the basic framework for ongoing research in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, including new gene therapy approaches. approaches. And it really provides a baseline, uh, uh, baseline data for these uh, ongoing 
Second example, again from the neuromuscular field, is spinal muscular atrophy. So the SmartNet um, registry was founded in 2013, eight years ago. And this was a registry to really collect basic data on treatment. And about five years ago, we had new treatments becoming available, gene, th gene therapy approaches for spinal muscular atrophy. And this systematic data collection via registry allowed the gathering of data as baseline for future um, interventional trials, which is really, really valuable. And it now is the framework for ongoing SMA research, including um, novel therapies. And this has also been a collaborative international approach where different centers or different countries have been collecting data and this has all been uh, put together, uh, which has been um, really, really successful. So uh, next example of registry is a platform residuous. So this is a registry of Drummy syndrome and other syndromes correlated with genes on SCM1A and PCH19. So this started a while uh, back in Italy and now includes many European countries. And this is um, a clinician-led prospective data entry is also part of the EpiCare um, framework of European countries. And this is the uh, website where you get further information about the platform the Residuos. And another example is the Grin portal. So this is an interactive website for families, clinicians, and researchers dedicated to comprehend um, Grin-related disorders. And here again, this is the uh, website for the Grin portal. What you can see here is that you have so basic information, information for families, you have uh, a variant analyses uh, page for clinicians, um, then a research page and uh, a Grin registry. And if you click onto the Grin registry, we'll see that leads you to either um, if you're from Europe, Asia, Africa, you can then participate. Or if you come if you come from the Americas or Australia, then uh, you can also participate. And this is a nice way for for patients to um, register um, uh, with these um, patients. Uh, registries. So the rationale really is for the registries to allow a systematic data collection to facilitate the in-depth genotype phenotype analyses and to um, serve as baseline for current and future care delivery. Because if you are able to monitor your current standard uh, of care and uh, collect data um, on current standards that will inform future care uh, developments. And this uh, should be a collaborative approach with national and international partnerships, which will ultimately drive up um, the standards uh, of care that we deliver to our patients. So talking about uh, registries, data, of course, are really important. And here, um, what's really important is the issue about patient consent and ethical approval. So if patients are allowed to enter uh, data themselves onto uh, patient registries, however, if clinicians enter data for patients, there has to be a framework for ethical approval. Uh, and the uh, aspect of data quality, of course, is really important. And then the question about should these be patient registries or professional um, registries where um, clinicians enter data. So the advantage is that uh, with patient uh, registries for patients can enter data directly, whereas if it's entered by a clinician, then there's an additional layer of quality control of what type of data entered into the database. And of course, this comes with the question of confidentiality and anonymity that mo many of these or most of these registries really work on uh, anonymized uh, data. Then there's the question about data protection mechanisms. So in the United Kingdom, we have a specific uh, data, a general data protection regulation, GDPR, and this is a framework across the United Kingdom that sets out the regulations for any patient-related data and where those are kept and uh, the uh, regulations and approvals that need to be uh, uh, in, um, in place, and there's national and international standards in this regard. And this is really important for if, uh, if you're aiming to have a registry across different countries. And now talking about data usage. So these uh, registry data are often held in data platforms, and those data platforms are held by professional companies who specialize in storing data uh, of this nature. 
and they uh, are of course governed by these um, uh, governance framework that gives them guidance on um, how data are processed and stored. Then the question is about the type of data that are collected. And most of these data, as mentioned before, will be anonymized data. Then it's important to really identify uh, that your, and specify your data input, because only um, if you input useful data, then you will be able to extract useful data at the end of the process. Yeah. So the data storage is really important, that so this is um, captured and uh, is uh, underlies and complies with all the regulations. And then there has to be a process uh, of how data are accessed and how the data output is managed. And again, um, it will only be possible to extract good quality data from a data set if good quality data have been input it into the um, registry in the first instance. And then, of course, it's worthwhile already to think about um, collaborations and sharing of data. And that's happening now um, across different countries that certain uh, types of registries are shared uh, and that there's uh, um, processes in place how this can be done safely um, with uh, um, the uh, anonymity of the individuals um, kept. And thinking about how um, registries uh, can be set up. So if these are um, patient registries, so you can have um, patient-led data entry, where patients are free to um, enter data um, from um, for themselves. Um, however, then also there's um, clinician-led uh, data entry, which is the case for a number of registries where uh, this allows a, an additional layer of quality control of what particular type of data are entered. For example, if you think about if different types of epileptic seizures are entered into a registry, you might want this to be entered by a clinician who understands the framework of classifying different seizure types and entering that versus a patient entering these data themselves. Then the question here about um, whether this is a, a one-off entry of data or whether this is um, a longitudinal data collection. So a very good example here is, again, from the North Star Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy a Registry that's been uh, collecting data for the last 18 years. Uh, it's a very good example of very successful longitudinal data collection. And of course, it's really important is that these data points you identify at the beginning for data entry that these are uh, useful and um, that they um, stand the test of time of having uh, having uh, planning for data entry for long uh, periods of time. Then, of course, all this will come with um, costs that are involved and funding needs to be there. Um, and this is really to maintaining, developing the database, but also then to guarantee ongoing data entry. Quality control is really, really important. So there needs to be a specific uh, process, and that is uh, in keeping with the laws of your own country, uh, which uh, applies to um, the um, confidentiality and data protection uh, and certain um, uh, order trails, how um, uh, it is guaranteed that uh, the data that are entered are of good quality. And this, of course, uh, requires um, uh, long term. Now, in terms of uh, setting up registries and participation, of course, there is the, the option to develop your own um, registry, but it might be beneficial to join established international um, registries. As illustrated before, there's a number of different organizations um, for different diseases who are always already have established international uh, registries that you are free to join, which you can either recommend to your patients to join if these are patient registries or if these are registries uh, that require clinician uh, entry, then uh, you as a clinician can actually um, enter uh, data into that registry. And so some examples here are the, um, the, the Grin portal um, for uh, patient data entry or the platform Residus for um, SM1A uh, driving syndrome related uh, disorders um, to have this entered via the clinician. And this uh, now was an overview of um, why um, registries uh, might be useful, um, in particular to capture the overall disease um, phenotype and to be ready for future therapies 
as a baseline and good starting point for ongoing data collection, uh, which will improve standards of care. And this leads me to the end of my presentation, and I'd be happy to take any questions in the discussion. Thank you.